Yesterday's prophecies, today's headlines. This is the Hal Lindsey Report. And now, Hal Lindsey. Good evening and welcome to this edition of the Hal Lindsey Report. On a stunning move, Russia, Iran, Syria, and Iraq announced they would begin an intelligence sharing cell headquartered in Baghdad. In 2003, the United States went to war in Iraq to stop Saddam Hussein from building, acquiring, and using weapons of mass destruction. But the U.S. didn't just defeat the country and leave. Following a long tradition in U.S. foreign policy, Americans stayed and helped rebuild Iraq at a cost of hundreds of billions of dollars. The nation-building effort also cost U.S. lives. This kept them vulnerable to terrorists. Out of that sacrifice, Iraq gained a new government and a real chance at prosperity. When the U.S. left Iraq without leaving any troops behind, ISIS filled the vacuum. Iraqi forces crumbled before their new enemy. America went back in with an air campaign that has been at least non-effective. U.S. and Iraqi forces worked in close consultation, including the intelligence sharing. But now, any U.S. intelligence shared with Iraq will be passed on to Russia, Iran, and the military forces of Bashar al-Assad. How could this happen? The U.S. has been fighting Iraq's enemies. They have been propping up their economy, building schools, hospitals, and power plants in Iraq for more than a decade. If the U.S. has leverage with anyone, it should be Iraq. But Iraq sold out U.S. interests in favor of Russia and Iran. They are two of the most brutal regimes in the world and known enemies of the United States interests. How could this happen? Two things. First, foreign allies have found the United States to be less than trustworthy over the last few years. Just ask the Free Syrian Army. They are our allies in Syria that are being blasted by the Russians with hardly a rebuke. Ask the Kurds. Ask Ukraine, a country that borders Russia. Just a couple of decades ago, Ukraine surrendered its nuclear arsenal on a promise from U.S.-led coalition to guarantee its territorial integrity. Ask the little girls of Afghanistan who were told their lives would be different, but are now abandoned. Ask Israel. The other reason for Iraq turned to Iran is something American policymakers never seem to grasp. In that region, religion is stronger than politics. Shia Islam constitutes a majority in both Iraq and Iran, making them natural allies. Most Syrians are Sunni, but these countries support Assad because he is an Alawite, a form of Shia Muslim. And then there is the mystery of Russia. For reasons even Vladimir Putin doesn't understand, Russia has allied itself with the so-called Iran or Persia. Russia's military buildup in Syria is purely in support of Assad. They strike targets that they identify as threats to Assad, including the supposedly moderate rebels allied with the U.S. In other words, Russia has gone to war against Syria's Sunni population. Some see Russia's new military presence in the Middle East as a positive development. Republican presidential candidate Donald Trump said, let Russia take care of ISIS. Even Secretary of State John Kerry expressed cautious optimism. At a UN meeting, Kerry said, if Russia's recent actions and those now ongoing reflect a genuine commitment to defeat that organization, that is ISIS, then we are prepared to welcome those efforts. Others take an entirely different view. Right after Kerry's remarks, former UN Ambassador John Bolton told Fox News, Secretary of State Kerry has made a devastating concession. He conceded that there is a legitimized role for Russian military force in the Middle East, something we have resisted for half a century. 
Russia is in a far stronger position, legitimized by the words of the Secretary of State. At a press conference last week, Julia Edwards of Reuters asked President Barack Obama, how do you respond to critics who say Putin is outsmarting him? The president talked about the quandary Putin's relationship with Iran and Syria has thrust upon him. He said, he's now just had to send in troops and aircraft in order to prop up this regime at the risk of alienating an entire Sunni world. Russia is all in on this. They're committed to Shia countries and Shia leaders. But why? President Obama is right when he says that it doesn't make sense. By throwing in its lot with Shia Muslims, Russia alienates the other 85% of the Earth's Muslims. While there are short-term advantages, in the long run, it seems to make no sense unless it's a hook being slipped into Putin's jaw. Ezekiel 38 says, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, Prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, and I will turn you about and put hooks into your jaws. God says Russia will be drawn into a climactic war with Israel during the tribulation. There will be hooks in his jaws. Russia and Iran have been fierce enemies since the 18th century. But now, just as the Bible predicted, near the end, they are forming a new and deadly alliance. The United States keeps trying the same old strategy in the Middle East, failing, then trying the same thing again. We love democracy and believe that when people get a taste of the real thing, they will take to it like a fish to water. It worked in Germany and Japan after World War II. It worked in Eastern Europe after the Cold War. U.S. diplomats reason that it will surely work in the Muslim countries of the Middle East as well, but it never does. In those countries, two kinds of leaders have emerged over the last century. The secular strongman who makes only token gestures toward religion and democracy and democratically elected Islamic radicals. There have been a few regimes set up by the U.S., but they're never strong enough to stand without help from the outside. Nevertheless, there persists in the mind of the American diplomats a fantasy figure, a kind of a Muslim messiah who will lead Islam into a more Christian-like posture with the world. The man will be Muslim but secular in his outlook. He will cooperate with outside government and treat his own people with respect. He will not be a man of passion but of pragmatism. Muslims with these apparent attitudes do exist, but they have no appeal to their fellow religionists and no chance of being elected. Middle Eastern Muslim cultures elect firebrands, not gentle pragmatists. Strong men rule. American-style leaders don't appeal to Middle East Muslims. As long as there is a Quran, this will continue. Jimmy Carter thought moderate Muslims would eventually take control of the Islamic revolution in Iran. George W. Bush tried to set up moderates in Iraq and Afghanistan. President Obama tried it in countries all over the Middle East as he stoked the fires of dissent during the Arab Spring. Each case has been a disaster. The Quran prevailed. Here's the amazing thing. After all that, American leaders continue to pressure Israel, our best ally in the region. They want Israel to gamble its very existence on the idea that we can succeed in Palestine as something we continually fail at everywhere else. The good guy Muslim leader we think can hold power in so-called Palestine is Mahfoud Abbas, president of the Palestinian Authority. But as we learned in Gaza, when his people are given a truly free election, they don't choose him. They choose a terror group, Hamas. For that reason, he constantly tries to show the West how moderate he is, while showing his own people that he's a radical. 
On September 28th, Abbas said in a speech to the UN General Assembly that the Palestinians will no longer be constrained by the Oslo Accords. He said, we cannot continue to be bound by these signed agreements with Israel, and Israel must assume fully all its responsibility as an occupying power. David Miller, a Middle East specialist, said, this is an expression of frustration and an effort to create a new point of political departure for his international drive for recognition. Miller said that the statement will not mean anything unless Abbas ends his security cooperation with Israel. No one even considers the possibility that the Israelis may take Abbas seriously and stop holding their end of the bargain. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu also made a speech to the UN General Assembly last week. Secretary Kerry was in New York at the time, but didn't bother to show up for the speech. Even America's ambassador to the UN, Samantha Power, was missing in action during the Israeli leader's speech. Nevertheless, his words were televised to much of the world and carried a powerful punch. Criticizing the Iran nuclear deal, Netanyahu said, 70 years after the murder of six million Jews, Iran's rulers promised to destroy my country, murder my people, and the response from this body, the response from nearly every one of the governments represented here, has been absolutely nothing, utter silence, deafening silence. And then, one of the most powerful and unforgettable moments in the history of such speeches, the Prime Minister stood silent, staring at his audience for a full 45 seconds. Finally, he said, perhaps you can understand why Israel is not joining you in celebrating this deal. Today, on Israel's northeastern border, troops and material from Russia, Iran, and China are pouring into Syria. Yet no nation opposes it. Everyone is indeed silent. Perhaps that 45 seconds of silence last week at the United Nations means that the world has finally and fatally abandoned Israel to its fate. But it's at its own risk. In his dramatic confrontation at the UN, Netanyahu observed something worth noting by the rest of the world. He told them of the great empires that oppress God's people. Then he said, and now another regime has arisen swearing to destroy Israel. That regime, Iran, would be wise to consider this. I stand here today representing Israel, a country 67 years young, but the nation state of a people nearly 4,000 years old. Yet the empires of Babylon and Rome are not represented in this hall of nation. Neither is the thousand year Reich. Those seemingly invincible empires are long gone, but Israel lives. The people of Israel live. Am Yisrael Kai. Folks, we're seeing daily now the setting of the last days stage as described by the Bible prophets. It is time to make certain you're ready to hear Jesus' call to his true followers. Come up here. It cannot be long now. I'm sure you know by now about the shooting last week at Umpqua Community College in Roseburg, Oregon. There were hints early on that the shooter was a troubled young man. He graduated from a high school in Torrance, California for students with learning disabilities and emotional issues. But you can't arrest someone for that. A vast portion of the youth in our culture face similar challenges. He was in the Army for less than five weeks in 2008, then discharged for failing to meet the minimum administrative standards to serve. Again, that's not nearly enough to be flagged as a potential mass killer. The shooter wrote in social media that he looked forward to being welcomed in hell and embraced by the devil. But strangely enough, 
in this culture, even that does not raise a red flag. It's just too common. In his social media posting, he often praised terrorists and mass shooters. He showed lots of pictures of mass gunmen. Here's how he described himself. I'm 20 years old in college. I like to listen to music, mostly goth, punk, industrial, electronic, and I love to watch movies. Horror movies are the best. He listed his preferred religious views as pagan, Wiccan, not religious, but spiritual. He said his hobbies were internet, killing zombies, and movies, music. He was part of several groups that were either anti-religious or all-out occult. But in fact, he was extremely religious. People Magazine reports, the Umpqua Community College shooter was obsessed with Satan and documented his devotion to darkness in a manifesto that was recovered from his computer. He wrote of his desire to serve darkness. A source who had read the manifesto told people, the guy did this strictly for satanic purposes. He did it to become a god in hell. He wants to be evil. That is his goal to serve Satan. Several witnesses have said that he asked some of his victims about their religion. He singled out Christians. To those who identify themselves as Christian, he said, good, you'll see God in a second. According to at least one witness, he would shoot those who said they were Christian in the head. He shot others who answered otherwise in the leg. He shot one girl in the back who never answered his question. When seemingly rushed by time, he was less discriminating, just shooting everyone. He admired the man who killed a television reporter and cameraman on live television in August. He wrote, on an interesting note, I have noticed that so many people like him are all alone and unknown, yet when they spill a little blood, the whole world knows who they are. A man who was known by no one is now known by everyone. His face flashed across every screen, his name across the lips of every person on the planet, all in the course of one day. Seems the more people you kill, the more you're in the limelight. The night before the shooting, someone, possibly the shooter, posted an online warning to people in the area not to go to school the next day. The discussion that followed was bizarre. Some tried to talk him out of the killings, but others egged him on. They even gave him tips on how to carry out a mass shooting, as if they had given the subject a lot of thought. Calls for greater gun control always come up in the aftermath of these shootings, including from the president. Even those who honestly believe that it will help have to admit that, at best, it is merely an attempt to manage a far larger problem. What's going on inside people? We've had mass casually killing throughout history, but not with this kind of frequency. What's going on inside the mind, spirit, and souls of these people? It's easy to blame guns, but guns aren't new. The frequency of these events is new. According to Mass Shooting Tracker, this is the 294th mass shooting event in the U.S. this year. They define mass shooting event as a shooting where four or more people are killed or injured. Romans chapter 1 says, They exchanged the truth of God for a lie, just that they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer. God gave them over to a depraved mind. God gives those who reject him the very thing they want, a lie. And that's the judgment coming on this generation right now. The only thing that can prevent this kind of tragedy is the gospel of Christ. Government has no answer. The answer is for those of us who follow Christ to pray, study, and witness. We need to recognize that this is a spiritual problem and the answers are also spiritual. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 says, Now the Spirit expressly says 
that in the latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. It then lists some of the works-oriented beliefs that people will teach as means of salvation, ignoring fundamental doctrine of salvation by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. When you hear someone replace Jesus at the center of salvation with the works of man, then you are hearing the doctrines of demons. It is a matter of spiritual warfare. Satan wants to diminish Jesus in whatever way possible. When you ask people the primary message of Jesus, they will often say, peace, or love, or love your neighbor, or feed the hungry. But the message of Jesus was himself. He said, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall not hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in the darkness, but shall have the light of life. And another, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me shall live even if he dies, and everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Satan continues to conduct a relentless, well-planned campaign to blind men's minds to the truth about Jesus. He loves to falsely use the scripture. He has centered his assault on the Bible and all who preach and teach it. With the Bible generally accepted as a revelation from God, mankind could not easily be blinded. As long as ministers preach and teach the Bible, Christians will grow in their faith. They will witness to the world, and they will not be deceived. When churches organize and function according to the New Testament pattern, they will not be swept away from their real purpose of building disciples and reaching out to the world with the good news about Christ. As the apostles neared the end of their lives, the Holy Spirit prompted them to give urgent warning about the coming attacks on truth and the church and the Christians themselves. They said those things would accelerate just before the second coming. And wow, are we seeing that everywhere today. In Paul's last session with the elders of the church at Ephesus, he gave the following exhortation. Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flocks among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves, men will arise speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be on the alert, remembering that night and day for a period of three years, I did not cease to admonish each one with tears. Paul predicted that there would be ministers from within the church who would teach perverted things while posing as teachers of truth. The antidote to apostasy is given in the next verse. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Paul exhorted the church leadership to place heavy reliance upon God and the word of his grace. When a minister ceases to teach and emphasize a personal faith walk with God upon the principle of grace instead of law, he has taken the first step down the road to apostasy. If you want to know the truth about the vital things we're discussing, you can find it in the book, Satan is Alive and Well on Planet Earth. Well, that's it tonight, folks. God willing, I'll see you next week. You've been watching the Hal Lindsey Report. To support this program, send your tax-deductible gift to Hal Lindsey Media Ministries, P.O. Box 470-470, Tulsa, Oklahoma, 74147. You can also support this ministry online. Visit hallindsey.com or call 1-888-RAPTURE.